Hi, I'm Brandon Poe, founder of Poe Group Advisors and creator of the Accounting Practice Academy. You are listening to the Accountant's Flight Plan Podcast, where we talk about stuff in the accounting world. If you're looking to buy or sell a practice, we are the premier accounting practice intermediary firm in the industry. Check us out at pogroupadvisors.com. If you're a firm owner looking to build a more profitable practice while actually reducing owner hours, sign up for our practice management workshop, which only runs a few times per year. Learn more at accountingpracticeacademy.com. Alex, thank you for joining uh, Accountant's Flight Plan Podcast. Uh, Folks, we've got Alex Lowenstein, who is the Senior Director of PARO for CPA Firms. Uh, He's been with PARO for over five and a half years, uh, leading the PARO for CPA Firms business unit for the past three years, overseeing all client and talent acquisition and matchmaking. Uh, He's originally from Metro Detroit and is an avid University of Michigan fan and alumnus. Uh, Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. Yeah, it's good. Um, We met at the uh, conference in Las Vegas last June at the ASCPA conference, and I saw your business model and I scratched my head a little bit. I think that's probably common for, I guess you encounter that sometimes, like, what is it you guys do? So, um, but before we get into that, just a little bit about you, if you would, just uh, can you share with our listeners about your background and how you got into helping people in this accounting world? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, as I sort of mentioned, and you mentioned in the bio, graduated from the University of Michigan, um, like a lot of kids, had no idea what in the world I wanted to do. And so um, kind of picked the city and the business model sort of business stage that I wanted to be a part of and said, Hey, I'd love to be in Chicago and I'd love to be working for a startup. So I was looking for jobs just to get as much ground level experience as humanly possible. I ended up landing a group on and was there for two and a half, almost three years. And it was a great experience. It was just, um, just after group on had gone public and they were starting to transition their business model to try and figure out, well, how can they expand their service offerings? How can they actually help their clients in a way that, they intended to, I think there was a pretty bad stigma at some point around Groupon and sort of the unintended consequences, um, but being able to be there and, and work and develop some new products and some new solutions for businesses around the country was a pretty great experience. It got me a really good taste of <clears throat> uh, sales, of business development, of entrepreneurship, of consulting, and um, took that experience and happened to just sort of have some mutual connections that led me to Paro. And at that point, Paro was an idea, a concept they had been around for probably four or five months. And the concept at that point was to truly be an outsourced finance department for small businesses. So in theory, acting as a, again, outsourced finance and accounting department for super small micro businesses and startups. Um, As we continued to grow and expand, we started to really understand the markets, the industries, where um, some of the industries were lagging behind. And one that just kind of jumped out to us was actually within our own sector being accounting. And so historically, we had viewed accounting firms as competitors when in reality, you know, they can be competitors, but they also can be great clients and partners for us because we understand what all CPA firms are experiencing from the big four all the way to the mom and pop accounting shops is that there is just such a dearth of talent in the marketplace and they are experiencing the capacity crunch where their clients are asking for more and they have less staff to do the work. So the work ends up falling on them, which then takes them away from their home, their families, they have no work-life balance and it just continues to snowball. And it's, it's hard saying no to new clients, but we found anecdotally that a lot of um, firms that we were working with were actually turning down clients. And, and as a business advisor, I'm sure one of the first things that you can say to your clients is don't turn down revenue. Um, but that's where this sort of the genesis of this business had come from. And, you know, in the span of a few years, we, we've grown pretty significantly. We're supporting over 250 firms across probably 500 or so projects and engagements, all surrounding how do we allow firms to maximize their capacity uh, and just think about staffing and and sort of non-traditional hiring methods differently. Um, Because again, this is an industry that is ripe for change. And I think people are excited for change. And if we can help them get better and help them help their clients in a way that um, 
benefits everybody, then I think I think there's a lot of room for for growth in there. Yeah. Well, what's a what's a really common sort of way that you help a CPA firm? Is it like, hey, I need I've got a client that really needs sort of a fractional CFO. We don't offer that service. Do you have somebody you can place? So it's like really my like really small placements, almost like a Uber for the Uberization of of high level staff. Yeah, it's level? it's a great question, and I think you know people laugh. Everything now is an Uber of blank, and, and in reality, there are aspects of it where, where the answer is yes. So the, the main ways that we would help a firm are, are in two ways. One is just true staff augmentation whether it's in a tax practice, in a, uh, an audit practice, a client accounting services practice, um, if we can take fractional resources that are within Paro's network in our marketplace <clears throat> and connect them with a firm, either to add capacity, to fill in a stock gap, to add a specific industry expertise, um, that's the main ways that we're helping at the firm level. But like you just mentioned as well, if a firm has a client where due to independence, they can't be working together, or maybe it's just not their core competency, then absolutely, we can be more sniper in the approach and say, hey, you know, again, we have a number of individuals within our network with ABC experience, helping the firm actually expand the breadth of service offerings that they have, and either work directly through the firm in a white label capacity or directly with that client. Um, and we're very liberal, and we love those types of relationships, because Really, at the end of the day, it's up to the client. It's up to the firm. Do they want to encompass the Paro professionals under their brand, or do they want to actually hand off that relationship to Paro? And in that case, we can typically just pay a referral fee, a finder's fee to that firm to say, hey, th thanks for kicking us over some business. We'd love to take it from here and compensate you for um, actually introducing us to those folks. And that's a very, it's a scalable, it's a repeatable model where a lot of firms can leverage that internally and externally. Yeah. Okay. Uh, nice. So I guess Paro has grown pretty rapidly. Um, how many people were at Paro when you started? Because you started right at the ground floor. Yeah, so. I started. I'm, I'm in a conference room right now in a nice office that we just actually jumped into right before COVID. We, we were in a shared workspace in a big conference room with five people when I started. And we were late at night throwing ideas up on the wall, trying to figure out how to actually make money. Um, mm -hmm. Flash forward five and a half, almost six years. And and we've raised something in the nature of 40 to $50 million. We've got 125 employees international. So we've got folks in a number of different countries. We've got folks spread across the U.S. Pr pretty crazy to see that type of growth here in a, in a short span, short yeah. comparatively. Well, it sounds like that's what you were looking for coming out of you're looking to get in a startup. It's a fun world. It is. It, it's the school of hard knocks. It's uh, the, the learnings that you have here in a startup in a, in a fast paced environment. Um, I would put it up against any business school education that you might find. Um, it's just, it's, it, it's a very diverse range of experiences that you get thrown right into. And I think that that's something that I've always enjoyed and yeah. um, working with smart people and get to your learnings and test and, and move on. And I think it's a, it's a great way to go about business. Yeah. Yeah. And that fast growth is uh, fun and chaotic at the same time. Yeah. Like organized stressful. chaos. <laughs> yeah, it really is. So, well, I mean, speaking of chaos, COVID was a little chaotic for everybody. Hopefully we're in the last bit of it now, in the last wave, but um, what did that do for Paro? Or what did it do for, yeah, what are your perspectives on the changes that, that COVID sort of forced on the profession? Yeah, it's a great question. I, and, and I think it's funny, not funny, a little, little morbid in some context. COVID was a terrible thing for the world. It was an amazing thing for the accounting profession for a number of different reasons, particularly from a digital innovation standpoint. To take a step back, Paro's model probably 99%, and it was even this number prior to COVID, 99% of our engagements are remote in nature. So you might have a firm in Illinois, you might have a contractor or freelancer in New York City, in Kansas City, right? Um, with COVID, there wasn't really an option to have people coming on site anymore. There wasn't much locally hosted software. Um, everything moved digital. Why? Because it had to, and because firms needed to continue to do their jobs. And when something like that causes a firm to make a change so quickly, yes, it might be overwhelming for the firm, but the long-term benefits completely outweigh the pain of getting it done right then and there. I couldn't tell you how many firms, and I'm sure that you guys had some firms say something similar, I can't believe that we went digital overnight 
or I can't believe how quickly we had to shift our systems and our processes. And now they look back on it and they say, wow, I am so glad that we did that then because it's only going to be more helpful for us going forward as we onboard new clients. It expands our geographical reach. It gets everybody at the firm comfortable with folks working from home and living in a digital environment. Um, and, and it's just so beneficial for this firm that I think a lot of folks have, have come to realize had been operating pretty behind, excuse me, the, the industry had been operating pretty behind in their ways for years and years. I heard somebody, I was at a digital innovation conference in Nashville this past December. I said, the accounting profession is 10 years earlier. It's 10 years behind, 10 years where it should be from a, a number of standpoints, particularly with regards to digital innovation. And so just thought that that was very interesting. And COVID has just completely accelerated that ramp um, mm -hmm. where you're getting folks who probably would have said, absolutely not, no way, I'll never hire a remote employee to now say, we actually love a remote employee because they might have different experience that we might have. There might be some wage arbitrage where we actually don't have to pay them as much if we're in a big market. There's just so many different reasons that um, COVID has impacted this, um, this industry. And, and, and I don't think that that change is going to be reversed just with COVID hopefully pittering out here in the near future. I had a, one of our clients that was selling, um, I had a conversation with her and she said, I just lost a really key person. And I said, well, what happened? And this person got offered a remote work and really wanted the remote work and they didn't have the ability to work remotely. And so they lost somebody. And that's what really got them to start thinking about this. And I think that's happened uh, across a lot of firms and the ones that aren't adapting are finding that the employees are driving the change. Yeah. And that's an interesting aspect of all this. Yeah, one of the unintended consequences has been sort of this consolidation and the, the not cannibalism, but, you know, folks are jumping to the best opportunities. And I think historically, the best opportunity was driven by money and compensation, whereas now it's about work life balance. We, yeah. we experienced this a ton, particularly given our model being freelance, you know, people don't want to work for firms. 365 days of the year, but they have a skill set that is valued by those firms, they can freelance, they can work on their own terms and work with a firm during busy season, during extension season, they're working on audits during, you know, 401k audits, um, but still have that flexibility to work when, where, and how they want. And that is actually jumped to the forefront of what is the most important aspect of a job, which is, do I have work-life balance? Yeah. And, and there's so many ripples that come from that. So, right. When you get a remote team, one of the big things that I've seen is, well, you don't have quite the oversight capability that you had or, there, you know, I mean, you can have digital oversight of people. But my, my point is, is like you have to manage differently. And one of the results that I've seen is you have more people abandoning the billable hour, tracking time, and you've gotten more and more into results focused type of measurements. Um you got everybody thinking more along results. You've got value pricing being implemented more and more so. And all of these things are really good for everything in the profession. Yeah. The, are you seeing? Are, I was going to say, while there are downstream consequences, there are some major, major improvements and actually very good things that have come from that. And that is exactly like what you said, the results orientation. Yeah. Which is, you know, for people who are entrepreneurial and in startup environment, it's all about results. And I'm glad that the accounting profession is starting to, to shift towards that as well. Yeah, they're just embracing it, which, again, I think if you asked anybody 10 years ago, would, would people embrace this? The answer is no, not unless they had to. Well, you know, for better or for worse, it's here. And if yeah. you, like you said, with the, 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 the woman that you guys were, were facilitating the acquisition with, if they don't do it, somebody else is and will, and, and they're going to lose people or they're going to get left behind. And I don't think anybody wants to get left behind in that regard. I feel like though the capacity crunch sort of caught a lot of firms off guard. It it certainly seemed to creep up really quick. And do you do you have any insight into why that capacity crunch happened and the way it did? Yeah, I, th I think it was kind of a perfect storm. Um, I think when you look at it like macroeconomically, um, right? There, there are more people who have been, I'm going to use that word, this word very lightly, somewhat burnt out from public accounting, where they're actually leaving public accounting for corporate accounting. Maybe they're working for the clients that they worked on, or they're just saying, hey, I've got my experience. 
don't want to do busy seasons anymore. I'm going to go jump to something in corporate. So you combine that with the fact that um, in macroeconomically, there are less people that are graduating college with accounting degrees, right? So the actual pool of potential staff has shrunk. And then of those folks who are graduating uh, schools with accounting degrees, fewer and fewer of them are going into public accounting. They're taking the first route, which is going into corporate accounting. So when you look at it purely from a talent perspective, the pool is just shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. When you combine that with the actual work that accounting, excuse me, that clients are asking of accounting firms, which historically had been do my taxes, audit my books, um, pretty rudimentary transactional work. It shifted more into the advisory capacity as the profession should, which is I want to be an advisor for my clients. That has created more work for those firms. So now you've got more work for the firms, less people even available to potentially do that work. That gap will only increase in terms of what can we do for our clients but ultimately, that creates that capacity crunch, which is if I am a partner and I have, you know, 80, 100 hours a week of work to do and I can't shift my work anywhere, well, I'm stuck doing that work. Maybe it's a staff, maybe it's a senior, whoever that may be. Someone is stuck doing this work and it has to get done. Right? It's not like you can just say, hey, I'm not going to do your tax return. <laughs> I'm not going to facilitate your month end close. And I think it caught a lot of people off guard because, you know, they had been doing this for years and years. But when you lose a staff member that is so critical in helping your operation run, the wheels come off. And it's not a quick fix to just find a perfect transition, plug somebody else right back in and they can pick it up like that and you've lost no steam. You know, there, there are some learning curves and, and, and there is some onboarding and, and there are some bumps that you're gonna take. And so I think when that happened, this capacity crunch just came to the forefront because this is universal, as I mentioned earlier. It, it's not just small firms that are experiencing this. It's mid-sized firms. It's large regional firms. It's large national firms. It's global firms. And so when that trickles all the way down, everybody is going to be impacted by it. So I kind of just think it was a perfect storm that was heading that way prior to COVID. And then COVID hit, which again, accelerated um, you know, these other aspects, the work-life balance, the remote working, the technology. It's just... It's a very interesting case study in how a trend can be impacted by something outside of everybody's control. And the thing that sort of adds insult to injury is once you're understaffed and you start loading up everyone else, then people want to leave because they're overworked. And then it's just, it just it's makes a vicious it worse. cycle. Yeah, it's a vicious cycle. I mean, we to give you an, an, an example, we had a client a few years back, even before COVID, and you know, he was a, a great client. He was towards the end of his career looking to sell his firm. He said, you know what? I would gladly pay somebody 10, 15% of my firm's annual billings so that I could go home on the weekends to my family and just sit down and have dinner or go on my boat, which I absolutely love. You, you can't put a price on happiness in a lot of this. Um, and this is an emotional pull from a lot of firm owners where they're just like you said, they're sick and tired of just getting beat up through busy season or pushing that work down to somebody else who then they feel beat up. And like you said, that cycle just continues. How do you break the cycle? You have to think of something that's non-traditional. Doing the same thing that you've been doing over and over isn't going to really get you anywhere. And so more firms are embracing this. You know what? I just can't keep doing what we're doing because it's not working and we're not retaining our staff, um, and we're not accepting new clients. And there's so many different branches of this that, again, I think the right firms are looking at this and saying, hey, this is a great opportunity for us to hit a reset button and really think of this differently than we yeah. have in the past. Yeah. And we're, um, you know, we're seeing that with our Accounting Practice Academy members coming through and they're just tired and, you know, they're, the firm owners are getting burned out. And so, I guess this is how Paro helps um, in a in a large way. So, what is Paro like? How does how does a firm that finds himself in that situation? They call you. Um, how are you guys able to to help? Yeah, great question. And, and I think you know, looking at it at, at the tagline, we we are helping to solve the capacity crunch, and it's a challenge again that everybody is experiencing. And so, we have a very unique 
process and model. It, it, it's very white glove. If you think about the Uber black, going back to that reference where it truly is that white glove service where again, think about our model on two different sides. On the talent side, freelancers, contractors, folks who have experience in public accounting, they've worked at large firms, mid-sized firms, small firms, they've got a technology experience, sure prep, CCH, Thomson Reuters, runs the gamut. What we actually do is we will onboard talent onto Paro's marketplace. We put them through an assessment where they're actually testing their tax or their audit knowledge, running them through background checks, credit checks, education checks, um, some aptitude questions and interviews where we can actually say, hey, these are the types of projects that you are interested in. This is your capacity. This is your experience level. We actually allow all of our talent to set their own rates. More often than not, we bill on hourly rates. So somebody can join our platform and say, hey, I want to make X dollars per hour. Fantastic. As long as that's within market, uh, market pricing, we have no problem with that. Uh, being a marketplace and facilitating these transactions and these relationships, we, we market up slightly just to meet market demand. But from that component, we are doing all that we can to onboard the talent to make sure that they meet our standards of criteria uh, and our quality standards. And from there, we actually would then work with our clients to understand their needs. Is it in tax? Is it in audit? Is it in CAS? What softwares are you using? How much volume are you doing? Um, what does a perfect resource and solution look like? Are there potential roads forward to say, hey, maybe we try this with tax and then we go, go into audit, we go into, into CAS, we're going to help them build a roadmap where in a perfect world, they can leverage PARO going forward for whatever need might come up and they can actually incorporate PARO into their staffing and capacity plan two, three, four years down the line. Yeah. And the kicker here is what is all facilitated is through our proprietary algorithm that we have built that is built and driven by AI to say, hey, we have seen these project types. We've seen these types of engagements. We've seen the criteria that these seven freelancers have, for example, that all share these same criteria. And this is what leads to a successful engagement. That matching is actually facilitated through a platform that we have built. This is not a self-service platform where a firm is going to go in and look through 15 different resumes and try and find somebody and schedule a call with them. We're doing all of that on behalf of firms. So if they give us the criteria, we can go into our platform, usually spits out two or three folks. We can say, hey, based on what we've seen and what our algorithm is showing us, these are the two or three best, best individuals that we feel your firm would benefit from, actually can introduce the firm and the resource or the experts, have them jump on a call and let that firm do some vetting for themselves. Tell me about your background, your skill sets. Here's what we're looking for. Here's what we do. Great conversation usually comes from that. And more often than not, we find that there is a fit between those resources. If not, not a problem. Can talk to somebody else, can recalibrate the algorithm and make sure that we do find that fit. So the whole goal here is white glove. We want to facilitate this all the way through. And even once we sign an engagement and we end up kicking off, we've got collateral, we have materials, we are really... It is in our best interest, the firm's best interest, and the client's, uh, and excuse me, and the expert's best interest for this engagement to go well. So we are helping to facilitate that as much as possible. Each firm gets a dedicated account manager that will oversee their engagement going forward. So this is not a, hey, Johnny's your resource. Good luck talking to Johnny. You never hear from Johnny again. Not my problem. This is very different than staffing. It's very different than recruiting. Uh, and I think we've built our model to really... Um, think firm first and expert first, where we can really, when we create great relationships, these are multi-year relationships that can build and build and build, which then gain efficiencies at the firm level. It builds a comfort level from the expert side. And, and that's what we want is people to feel comfortable still doing the work that they like, but on their own terms at the firm side and at the expert side. Yeah. It's not terribly uncommon for how we match buyers and sellers. Yeah. Like we have a process and everybody has to go through the process and you learn so much as they go through that, right? I imagine your uh, firms have to go through a, a bit of a process as well. Um, now, just a question I was thinking when you were talking about all this is, do you do small engagement placements too? Is it just full-time uh, placements? Is it part-time placements? Is it one-off project placements, like all of the above? Yeah, good question. I would say it is almost everything but full-time W-2 placements at a firm. 
If a firm is looking for somebody 20, 30, sometimes even 40 hours a week for a specified time period through busy season, that right in the wheelhouse. Maybe it's a small one-off engagement where one of their clients needs uh, cleanups and reconciliations. Great. Um, maybe this is, excuse me, 20 to 30 hours a week throughout the course of the year that just doesn't necessitate a full-time W-2 hire at the firm level. Great. Do that as well. This is not a remote staffing company where we are placing an individual into firm, they are being hired W-2 by the firm, and then we are making some sort of a referral fee or a percentage of first year salary. We have some great partners who actually do that. Um, so when, when firms come to us and they say, hey, we're looking for this, we're more than happy to connect them with some of our partners, same thing, vice versa. Um, but it's just not a, a space that, that we play in, that we want to play in. And we're very candid about that. Or if, if somebody is looking for full-time or if it does necessitate full-time, we're, ha we're happy to tell them that. Um, but this is part-time, seasonal, fractional uh, contract per diem. You can think about it however however it's, you want. It's the independent contractor that wants the freedom to kind of work exactly. on projects. Exactly. It's the 1099, which has been just so prevalent, um, particularly here, given, like we said, the Ubers, the Grubhubs, the Top Tals, the Upworks, the um, other marketplaces that yeah. are like the Fivers. They're, they're pioneering this space and we're, we're jumping in there too. Right. Upwork comes to mind. Like when you're explaining this, like I've used Upwork for various projects mm -hmm. and um, have always been quite happy with the talent pool but by narrowing your focus, um, I can see the value in that. So, yeah, it, it's um, funny. We, we hear a lot of folks, and you said it beforehand when, we, when you introduced it, you, you come by the booth or you, you look at the website, you go, tell me exactly what this is. And we start to explain it. And usually the first response goes, why didn't I think of something like this? Yeah. It, it's not a revolutionary concept. It's just taking the marketplace, the matching, just like what you guys are doing um, with the different firms that, that, that you're helping facilitate and just bringing it to a different industry. And that model works. Contractors have always been a thing in accounting. They've always been a thing in finance. But how do we consolidate that and just make that process better for everybody involved? Well, and the remote work thing is really fascinating because you can actually get better talent. Like if you're in Chicago, and but you really need somebody that's super niched down into this particular thing. Well, you might not have a very big talent pool. Maybe Chicago is not the best answer because it's probably a big city with a big talent pool. But you, you know, you get my my drift is like your oh. best talent might be in Idaho or something, and you've got this specialist. And um, the remote work allows that geography just to kind of fade away as an obstacle. Yeah. I, I, and I think people historically had had, number one, a misconception around freelancers, right? When you think freelancer, you think somebody who can't get a job, which now that we know is, is not the case. And I think when you think remote, say, well, why would I look at somebody in Idaho, as you said, if, if I don't have to? Well, what we have found more often than not, particularly with vetting, is there are a number of these folks that are living in non-super big markets that due to circumstances outside of their control or, or Maybe it is within their control. They just don't want to live in those cities anymore. They have the exact experience that somebody in Chicago might have, but they're living in Idaho or they're living in Topeka, Kansas. More power to them. We had an individual who was a worked for a top 100 CPA firm for years and years and years. And her husband got a job as an athletic director at a high school in Corpus Christi, Texas. Well, she had big, you know, top 100 experience at a New York City firm. And she's now living in Corpus Christi. Who is to say she can't do that job just as well as anybody else living in New York City? So like you said, that when the geographic borders are dropped, it just opens up your talent pool to find the best resource or resources regardless of where you are. Yeah, yeah, it's, um, it's interesting. Well, as a firm, you know, I mentioned that we had a firm lost a key employee. How do these firms distinguish themselves to attract um, employees. Yeah. How, how do they, what do they, what does it, what does a firm need to do to be attractive? I, I think it's a great question. And, and it's funny, you know, this is now a question that a lot of firms are asking themselves, which is how do I make sure that I get the talent versus my competitor, my colleague, whoever it may be. And I think the, the, the first, as you've seen, as you've mentioned, I, I think you have to embrace new, you, ha you have to be jumping in 
at least with one foot, if you can get two feet in there, fantastic, but embrace new, new technology, new perspectives, new business lines, new services, new processes. If you can't embrace new, how do you expect to have anybody who's looking for one of these jobs to join your firm versus another firm that isn't, that is embracing new? And so that's what we recommend to firms all the time is, I know this might be scary. I know it might be daunting. There might be an initial cost, but I can tell you, if you don't do that, the cost is way higher. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and it's a little messy. New yes. Is messy. yes. A little uncomfortable for someone who likes to make sure all their T's are crossed and I's are dotted. It's, uh, it's okay. <laughs> It is right. Change is change is not always great. Change, change in this context is good. Yeah. And I think when you can embrace it and go back to our conversation we we're having earlier, right? Think about if you can embrace new technologies, new software, new process. If you can actually build the process to make your firm attractive and you can institute the right resources to allow the, the folks at your firm to you know, be okay with their workload and to work on some of the projects that they want to be working on. Think about how much that helps your retention at the firm. Well, now you're not going back through this cycle of, oh, somebody left. Now I got to transition their clients. I got to go re-recruit new people. Now I have to onboard them. Those people might leave. If you can stay out of that wheel, you're yeah. winning. You're, yeah. you're, you're absolutely winning. And so the employee engagement, the employee retention, that is a huge factor here. Um, and I think firms can own that. Yeah. yeah. Well, so much change has happened in the last couple of years. Care to take any predictions about what will happen going forward? You rub my crystal ball. Um, I, I, again, I, I think that the strides that I've seen here in the last three to five years have, have, have been pretty impactful. And, you know, I, I don't think there's any question that that's going to continue. And that's a bad answer here. So I'll give you a different one. But I, I think that, you know, we're going to see more firms innovating. We're going to see more AI, uh, particularly around automation. Um, I think there's some companies that are out there that are doing that. They're doing it well. I think we're starting to see, and this would be my big prediction, is that I think legislation is going to change pretty significantly, hopefully. Um, I think when you think about um, 1099s and W-2s and some of the, the legislation around that, uh, 1099 has become such a force and the legislation is still slightly behind in terms of worker classification. I'd say there's, you know, other IRS aspects. 7216 is one to co that comes to mind, which is, you know, taking work and, and shifting that um, overseas. Well, there's a number of companies that are actually doing that, um, you know, with regards to disclosure. I think that that's something that can and should change because it's a very, very gray space. Um, particularly given the rise of sure preps and some of these outsourcing companies, and they're all great. They've got great business models. Um, I just think that when you look at the legislation as it is written, it just, it wasn't thinking about what might come in terms of the innovation. And so I think that there's some um, excellent folks that are, that are working on Capitol Hill to actually adjust some of this legislation and fight for some of this legislation because Innovation is going to be what propels this industry forward. And I think that there's a bit of a limiting factor when it comes to that with the current letters of the law. So if I had to predict anything, I would say that there should be or could be um, some pretty good legislation reform positively for firms to be able to continue to optimize the way that they do business. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. It's going to be exciting to watch. I think, like you said in the beginning, it's it's good. Overall, this is very positive, um, but it will be uncomfortable and it will be disruptive. But um, yeah. All right. So uh, before we completely close off, i got a couple of little quick fire questions for you. Bring it on. Um, if you're going to recommend one book to our listeners, what would that be? Can I give you two? Sure. I just I just read a book. I'm a big foodie. So I just read uh, Anthony Bourdain's Kitchen Confidential, which is a great book. Uh, very enlightening on, on what the rest, rest, restaurant industry is. Um, very, very fun book if, if any of the listeners out there are, are interested in food. And I read a book, big, big historical, uh, big history guy, big nonfiction guy. One of my favorite books is called Undaunted Courage. And it's the story of Lewis and Clark. So I think everyone hears about Lewis and Clark and you know, Louisiana Purchase, and they went to the Pacific Ocean and came back. When you actually read and understand how they did it, 
and what they experienced, it's phenomenal. It's, it's mind blowing how in the early 1800s, a couple of people could just, all right, let's go. We'll see you guys maybe in a couple of years um, and make it back with some amazing findings. So if anybody likes history, I think that's just a phenomenal book. It's called Undaunted Courage. Well, I would expect someone who just throws himself in the startup environment would like something like that. Hey, so. I've, got, I've got nothing on Lewis and Clark. I can promise you that. <laughs> These guys are pioneers in the purest sense of that word. It, it's unbelievably admirable. Yeah, yeah. Nice. I like those recommendations. Those are unique. So yeah. thank you for that. Yeah. And then um, what's one bit of advice or life lesson that you could share? I think a big one for me is, 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 is embrace change. And again, I think it's kind of been the theme here and I, it's a little bit boilerplate, but you know, if, if, if you can't at least be open or embrace change, you, you can't develop, you can't grow, you can't learn, you can't fail. Failure is, is such a big part of business and development. And as long as you're not failing on the same aspect over and over and over again, you know, I think that's growth. Um, so I think people who are willing to embrace change and are pushing themselves to embrace change, businesses that are embracing change, um, they will develop and they will continue to succeed um, rather than you know companies that just look and say, well, we've done this for X, Y, and Z number of years. Why would we change, right? So I think that's just a big thing is be open to it, be mindful of it, be cognizant of it and, and throw yourself in the mix because you're, you're more often than not, you're going to surprise yourself. Yeah, I love that. Perfect. Well, what's the uh, best way for people to follow you, connect with you online? If, if they want to find me on LinkedIn, I'm happy to share my LinkedIn coming out of this. Again, Alex Lowenstein, uh, my email address, very simple. I'm usually pretty on top of my email, alex at paro.io. Very simple. Um, but anybody who's open for a conversation about the industry, about the business, about their firm, about Paro, anything along those lines, we're always excited and, and, and open to hearing stories and what people are experiencing because and I'll say it to you here, we're, we're all in this together. We have a number of partners and, and folks that we work with in the accounting space, and everybody has a similar mindset here. And it's it's going to take all of us to help continue to drive this trend. And the more that we can support each other with this and the firms and the talent, again, everybody wins. And, and that's really what, what, what drives this industry forward. Awesome. Love it. Alex, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Hope to see you in, in Las Vegas or uh, on the conference circuit here soon. Yeah, we'll... Uh... We will definitely see you again on the conference circuit. Sounds great. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to the Accountant's Flight Plan Podcast. If you like what you heard today, please follow us so that you can get updates when new episodes are released and share our podcast with your friends and colleagues. You can also follow Poe Group Advisors on social media. Please visit our website for more information at pogroupadvisors.com.